Thanks so much, Peter. I appreciate it. So I think you're you're familiar. You have everyone's bios uh, in your in your um, material. So we're not going to. Although you can see that Glenn Jones, who's uh, at Texas A&M Galveston, has spent much of his career uh, looking at uh, the relationship between population and energy sustainability. We have um, Ryan Hobart, who directs the UN Foundation, Senior Director for Energy and Climate at the UN Foundation. And then at the end, Jacob Scher, who I've been at UN climate conferences with, which I hope to forget as quickly as they uh, as they're gone, but is now the, as the Senior Advisor to the International Program at, at NRDC. So with that, I'm just going to start uh, straight with questions, and I'm going to start with Ryan. And um, so I'd like you to just give us a little context of kind of how the Sustainable Energy for All initiative came about, what was the thinking behind it, and in terms of why was their decision made to establish it. So if you could just start with that. Sure, yeah. It's, it's interesting. At the United Nations, uh, a lot of issues have been dealt with, peace and security development, and interestingly enough, uh, energy issues were not, were not in the mix until fairly recently. You had some small projects here and there, but it wasn't a top-line issue. And so in 2011, uh, after working with, with some colleagues, this, the, the Secretary General of the United Nations established something called Sustainable Energy for All, which is an initiative uh, that aims at, at galvanizing support from across societies, governments, private sector, civil society, uh, to really spur action on energy issues uh, across the board. So uh, it has three objectives. One is reaching universal energy access by 2030. The second is doubling the rate of improvement in energy efficiency uh, on an annual basis. And the third is doubling the use of uh, renewable energy globally uh, all three of those objectives are by 2030. <clears throat> and what we've seen is, is, a, is a real thirst for that kind of leadership at that global level. And we've seen energy issues really pop up to the top of uh, the international agenda. Sustainable Energy for All got a lot of uh, com commitments, uh, both in terms of financing and in terms of number of partners, both public and private, uh, at Rio in 2012, uh, just a few months after it was launched. Um, and it's really a widespread effort uh, uh, on, on a global scale to get uh, these critical issues uh, in the mix. And I'll just say one more thing, which is there's a post-2015 process going on on development. What do we do after the Millennium Development Goals expire uh, later this year? Uh, and energy, for the first time, has been taken up in that conversation. There's a proposed sustainable development goal on energy. There's also a climate goal, which we might might talk about uh, as well. And so there is a, a lot of energy in the system for a, a much more in-depth conversation, both about energy poverty, why some people don't have energy and what kind of an effect that has on their life. How can they run a business, run a, you know, you, how can you do a hospital or, or or, or run a school, as well as the climate issue and the, 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 the key energy components of renewable energy and energy efficiency. Okay, now I'm going to go over to Glenn, and I can, oh, okay, thanks, Brian, if you want to give that. Um, and so I wanted you to put some numbers to it, and then I'm going to go to Jacob for kind of a bigger picture. But, you know, could you give us a sense of, you know, obviously I know when, when Sustainable Energy for All launched, they, you know, they gave both some uh, numbers on you know how much this would cost and what it would mean in terms of deployment but as someone who looks at this could you give us a sense of what it means to truly scale up renewable energy and energy access uh, you know throughout the century so if you could just talk a little bit about that. okay um, yeah some of the re research that we do is we're looking at um, the increase in population as we go through the 21st century we're looking at that um, decreasing in the availability of the fossil fuels people talk about peak oil or peak coal, and so you're going to have to ramp up the renewables anyway um, to do that as we get through the 21st century. And so if you look at some of the numbers, I mean, right now the world population is about 7.2 billion people. The latest UN projections are by the end of the century, you're going to have 10.9 billion people in the world. By 2100, right now, um, you have uh, about 30% of that population is in sub-Saharan Africa or in South Asia. 
the, the areas that the uh, UN Sustainable um, for All program is, is focusing on. By the year 2100, 55% of the world's population will be in those two regions. And right now, those regions, the actual per capita um, energy consumption within those regions are extremely low. In the United States, the average person uses about 300 gigajoules of energy per year. The average person in Europe uses about 130. The average person in South Asia uses about 26. And the average person in South of Sub-Saharan Africa uses about 17. So the problem, it's an enormous problem. It's, the population is growing enormously. They're starting from an extremely low base of per capita energy consumption. And what people that study this problem look at is that to, to be a, a healthy society, as, as far as um, just overall health, uh, um, the lowering the number of un, undernourished children, et cetera, um, you need to have about 100 um, gigajoules per person. And right now, those regions are about one-fifth of that number. So as we move through the 21st century, how are we going to scale uh, up the, the energy to get to those people? How are we going to scale up the renewable energy to, to get to those people? Now, when you look at the Sustainable Energy for All program, we work with some people at the, uh, um, at the World Bank as well. And when you look at those numbers of, of those goals of what they're trying to do, the, the actual rate of increase of renewables in, in the world has actually gone up about 0.04% per year in the last 20 or 30 years. And in order to achieve the Sustainable Energy for All program, it should be going up at about 0.9% per year. So even though you're making progress toward becoming 100% of the world being electrified, it's not at a rate fast enough to actually achieve it by the 2030, 2050 period of time. So the world, we have an enormous challenge to, to actually um, reach these goals. And also, right, and so in terms of the people who are targeted by this program, 95% of them are either in the developing countries in Asia or sub-Saharan Africa, right? That, that, that's where, that's where, it's really those two regions of the world right. where, where they're going to be focusing on, yes. Exactly. Okay, now if you could pass it down to Jacob. Um, you know, you've talked about kind of the new global architecture that we're seeing in trying to work on kind of the goals of climate, energy access, and sustainable development. Could you talk broadly about how you see this program fitting into that? And then we're going to drill down on some of the possibilities and challenges okay. that come with doing that. I'd be happy to do that. Uh, as you mentioned, Juliet, you and I have confronted one another or been with one another at many climate conferences. And I think if you, when I started my career at NRDC in the 70s, we thought that if you got a global agreement, uh, that that would solve problems. And what we've seen is that, uh, that that way of working has not produced the results that both CO2 emissions, the concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere has continued to grow in spite of the fact that we spent 25 years negotiating agreements, both binding and non-binding. Uh, in her final speech as Secretary of State, uh, Hillary Clinton uh, in January 2013 made the point that uh, the world had really tr changed tremendously but that the structures that we had in place at the United Nations and the international realm simply were not up to the challenge. And that she said we needed a new architecture for a new world that looked less like a Greek temple where every single column is exactly the same and more like a Frank Geary building where you recognize that it's just not nation states anymore, that cities, corporations, states are extraordinarily important and that if we're going to bring about the kind of transformation that Under Secretary Orr was talking about in the energy area, that we have to get everybody engaged. And I think it was this philosophy and this desire for a new architecture, a new approach, that really recognized the, the range of stakeholders that are involved, really is part of the impetus for the creation of the Sustainable Energy for All uh, uh, an initiative. Uh, you know, Ryan's talked about the fact that there are three large goals, but I think what's really significant about the, and, and really a breakthrough in regard to this initiative is that it's not just, it was, it was not globally negotiated, those goals weren't globally negotiated, and the, the membership is not just nation states, but also corporations, civil society organizations, cities and mayors, and what the UN is doing is rather than creating kind of a global plan, instead is creating a platform that brings together all these different actors to really figure out ways to bring about the transformation on the ground where it really matters. 
Got it. And so now, and I'm hoping that um, Ryan and Glenn can, can chime in, and then, of course, I'm sure Jacob has different additional thoughts. So, you know, and I've seen this, what I think is really interesting is, you know, just obviously this expansion of kind of the playing field of, of people who are working on this. You know, again, it has gone beyond, say, the delegates who would might meet periodically to negotiate um, through the UNFCCC to, you know, again, corporations, foundations, outside players, and I do want to talk uh, in a bit about what the UN Foundation is doing. But what, what I find really interesting, and I see this now covering the White House kind of across the board, which is that f the federal government, and this applies, of course, to governments nationwide, facing financial limitations, facing political gridlock, have increasingly tried to get the private sector foundations to kind of step up and really also drive the goals that they outline. And, you know, while I think in some ways that, of course, addresses some of the problems that, that these individual governments face and the challenges they've had, there are also challenge, there's, there are pitfalls in kind of relying on outside actors to d deliver on what are, for example, maybe even broadly accepted goals. So I wonder if, if you all could point out both where, in, again, in the context of of this policy discussion, where you feel like things are really working and where you feel are the biggest problems that, that we have cropped up in kind of asking others to deliver on what traditionally has been much more of a governmental uh, task. Yeah, I, th I think the idea behind sustainable energy for all is not that uh, the government governments would abdicate their role. And I think um, we'll continue to have climate change negotiations. We'll continue to have the U.S. giving to the World Bank and other institutions that are going to be doing more traditional types of things. Um, I think it's that... The, so, so the logic originally behind sustainable energy for all was if you can create this kind of a platform, if you can encourage governments to come to the table and, cha and change the rules by which they operate, then you get the kind of private investment, you get civil society uh, helping achieve those, those overarching goals. And so it's really, I would see it more as a, a, a parallel uh, to what's already going on in an increasingly complex world where actors perform all kinds of different tasks that maybe in the past they would have been, uh, you know, they, they might have been relegated to more, you know, traditional types of functions. And so um, it, the, the, I think what's interesting is that sustainable energy for all has spurred very different types of thinking depending on which of the three goals you're talking about. On energy access, there's a lot of very small scale. So for example, at the United Nations Foundation, uh, we're working through something called the Energy Access Practitioner Network to get all the people who are working on decentralized energy systems uh, throughout the world to get better resourced, resourced connected with each other, um, and financed to do the kinds of things they're doing and really scale up so that we get to a you know, point, point Four percent uh, improvement per year in, in, in access to more like you know one percent, um, and there are all kinds of different things that are going on. Really fascinating things that really mimic more what we've seen in the telecom in industry, leapfrogging landlines and going straight to decentralized systems that are uh, dependent on on very small companies or, or social enterprises doing really interesting work using a mix of. Uh, you know, cell phones and mobile banking and all kinds of new and, and clean energy technologies and mixing that all up and coming out with some, some, some new kinds of opportunities for people at the bottom of the pyramid. As I said earlier, I mean, the, the challenge, it's, it's this enormous challenge. So if you look at, uh, again, the numbers that in, um, for, the, for the world, by the time you get to the end of the 21st century, and again, that's a long time away, the predictions probably aren't going to be right, but we're just playing in the, 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 the boundary conditions. But you're going to need an enormous amount of renewable energy for the world. And most of that, about 80% of that renewable energy is going to be in those two regions, the sub-Saharan Africa and, and in South Asia. Enormous numbers. I mean, talking about like 991 exajoules. That's, that's about twice the amount of energy. Just in renewable energy, that's about twice the amount of energy that the world uses today with, with all of the energy. So there's enormous opportunities if you think about it from the private sector. I mean, there's going to have to be, you know, you talk about leap shot, leapfrogging technologies. There's going to have to be innovative thinking in, in how, do, how do we scale up, how do we produce, you know, millions of wind turbines per year. Literally, that's what it's going to take. How are we going to produce 
thousands of square kilometers of solar panels per year to make this thing work. It's going to take the private sector to do that. So I, I think if people recognize the scale of the problem, they recognize those opportunities, but you're, at the same time, you're going to need governments to kind of step in to kind of help jumpstart these things. So it's going to have to be a partnership between governments, whether it's, say, the U.S. government or, or, or from a U.N.-type level, and the private sector. It's going to have to be a combination of those two. And Jacob, could you talk a little about also maybe the private sector and what NRDC has done on that front and what you've seen well, in recent years? Yeah, let me, you know, I think often it's, I, I don't think it's an either or. I mean, I think the, the, in terms of government versus the private sector and civil society, and I think it's really, um, you know, if you recognize the, 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 sco the scale of the challenge and also the time scale, we don't have 20 or 30 more years uh, to, make, to really begin this transition. It's really about, uh, you know, as, as Secretary General uh, uh, Ban Ki-moon put out, it's really about all hands on deck and really figuring out a way of, you know, energizing uh, literally uh, leadership at every level of society to begin this transition. And so I, you know, I, so I think that, it, it, you know, it's really, uh, you know, I think, 2015 is going to could potentially be a really pivotal year. Uh, you know, we're going to have uh, negotiations not only of a new climate agreement uh, in in December in Paris, but also we will have a summit in September at the UN at which the leaders of the world are supposed to adopt a new set of, of sustainable development goals. And I think it really, if we're really going to be serious about dealing with this crisis, we have to really. This has to be a year in which we see real public engagement political will, and the creation of structures that are really going to accelerate this transition to a low-carbon world. And I think that's going to require us to be thinking about different kinds of structures than we've had in the past. Too often when we, we go into these pro UN processes, it's sort of a blank slate. And we don't recognize the fact that there are right now, we've counted somewhere on the order of about 18,000 commitments to do something about energy and climate that have been made by governments. Uh, at all levels, corporations, civil society organizations. And one of the challenges we have, and we need a lot of help on this, is how do we structure and organize this new world of so many actors? Because it's much more complicated, but I think it's clear that the real world looks a lot more like the internet than the international system. And I think that's a real challenge for us as well. And let's talk a little about those sustainable development goals. And uh, again, having after covering for multiple years the UN climate talks, I realized there was an institution more dysfunctional than the US Congress, which is what I had spent my career covering before then. Um, and But you know, the interesting thing is this is a moment where oddly there is more optimism about the UN climate talks than we've seen in a long time, um, largely because of, of course, the uh, the agreement that uh, the US and China recently struck in terms of, of their climate targets. Could you talk a little about how the sustainable development goals play into all of this? And, and you know, what do you see as the interplay between those those two processes? So why don't Ryan, you start and then anyone. Uh, it's, yeah, it's a fascinating year, as Jacob was saying, two major processes coming together. And as I mentioned before, uh, they are already linked up in a certain way. I mean, one, they're UN processes, which doesn't necessarily mean that people are talking to each other because they have been traditionally pretty stovepiped. But you do, in proposed sustainable, energy, uh, sustainable development goals, uh, that the ones that will be adopted in September, you do have goal number seven is, is basically sustainable energy for all with the three objectives as, as indicators under under that goal. And you also have a climate goal, which right now has an asterisk saying basically will mimic what happens in the climate talks, so pending whatever gets agreed there. And so, um, but uh, I, I think the key point is an initiative like Sustainable Energy for All, this is exactly the conversation that the Secretary General wanted to start when he created Sustainable Energy for All, because it's basically saying that energy poses two problems. On the one hand, some people don't have access, that's a poverty issue. On the other hand, some people use energy too inefficiently, uh, not cleanly enough, and that's creating a, prob a, a climate problem, which is also inc you know, increasing poverty. Um, 
So, so we're starting to see more crosstalk. I think in the advo- ac- advocacy world, we're also seeing more of that. Uh, there was just an initiative launched uh, on the 15th called Action 2015, which is about bringing these two, uh, these two issues together. These, com- these advocacy communities have also been separated. You've got the environmental NGOs working on climate on the one hand, and then you've got the development NGOs working on, on the development issues on the other. And this is an effort to bring those two together because of the timeline and the fact that this year we're going to be dealing with both, but also the recognition that you can't not deal with both because they're so interlinked. And the last thing I'll say is on the financing side, um, there's going to be a major conference in Addis in, in July to look at how you finance the development agenda. And one of the critical issues within within the climate talks is how do you raise the money that's necessary to do both adaptation and mitigation. And I, so I think inevitably we're going to see these two conversations start to merge because a lot of those dollars are going to be the same dollars and governments hate to admit that but if you're doing an adaptation a climate adaptation project in guinea is that climate change or is it development well it's both and so we have to figure out how to optimize those resources which are scarce at the moment uh, but also show that these two conversations aren't separate and that they need to be if you know if not one in the same same, at least parallel with a lot of interconnections. And Glenn, did you have any thoughts, or I can also go on to the next one? Yeah, yeah, just a, just a general yeah. comment. One, one of the uh, um, other issues that, that you see is with this, the, exactly the, this, this nexus between the, uh, the desire or, or the will to kind of control the uh, CO2 in the atmosphere, whether you're talking about the, the two degree limit or the 450 part per million limit, um, as well as this other problem now that you have this world population, if you believe the UN numbers, I mean, the world population is, is going to be 10.9 billion in 2100. You look at just what happened in the last month or so in, in, uh, in India with uh, Prime Minister Modi. You know, when he was asked, I mean, you, you've got, on one hand, he's got the issue, are you going to participate in the climate change type discussions? On the other hand, you've got 400 million people in India that are off the grid. So what he's going to do as Prime Minister of that country is he's going to side with his people. He said, And he's actually said, you know, we're not going to pay much attention to the climate side of it. We're still going to be using coal. We need to get our people on the grid. And so, again, you've got those problems. So how do, how do, it's, it's just one of these, these nexus problems. How do, how do we solve both of them? And it looks like, again, given the trajectory of the number of people um, that are off the grid right now, the desire to get them on the grid, and if you'd want to try to stay below the 2 degrees C, it's almost impossible to do that. To, to do, you can't do both. I'm sorry, Ryan, did you want to jump in? Yeah, yeah. can I just say yes. one more? So, so IEA made some projections a couple of years ago that actually two-thirds of all the access, all the people who don't have access who need it and who will get it over the next couple decades is actually going to be, is actually going to come from off-grid. And so we, I think we need to be changing the way we think about this. I think there will be some centralized systems, although included in, in the announcements and in, in the rhetoric coming out of India was also a big announcement on renewable energy. But we also need to think about how are the people who are off the, off the grid and will never get the grid because they're in a remote village or whatever, how are, how are they going to get access? And in a lot of cases, renewable energy is a better solution than, say, a diesel genset in a small village. Got it. Uh, oh, sorry. No, I, just, yeah. no, I was just going to mention, I think that you know, it's been unfortunate that, so, that the discussion of climate change has been somewhat divorced from discussion of sustainable development. Uh, and I, I like to quote the two, two Stearns, Lord Stern mm-hmm. and Todd Stern. And the reality is, is that we're not going to, we're not going to solve a climate change challenge unless we get sustainable development. We'll never have sustainable development unless we deal with climate change. And I think it's been somewhat unfortunate that in some ways the climate change discussion has turned into sort of a big global air pollution problem. And we've sort of developed language about mitigation and adaptation, which is, is helpful in kind of framing it, but it's often very, very distant from the reality of politicians and, and, and business people and, and ordinary individuals and really understanding the fact that we really do have to figure out a way to meet the needs of an ever-growing population on a finite planet 
by going through the kinds of transformations that, that uh, Under Secretary Orr was talking about Got today. Um, okay, so we have a lot of good questions. So I'm going to, while I have more questions to ask, I'm going to go to some of these and then, you know, we'll talk back and forth. So the first question is, of course, the agreement between the U.S. and China is very important, but no one has been talking about U.S. and India and Obama's recent visit. What impacts do you see from that effort? And I would be just interested, I mean, obviously, and Glenn, you alluded to it, clearly, you know, India is a huge um, you know, part of this equation. And while the U.S. worked very hard and coming up with an announcement, it obviously fell far short of not just the U.S.-China agreement, but even what, you know, some people had anticipated might come out of that uh, journey. So could you just talk a little about, uh, you, you know, maybe Glenn first, but anyone, about, you know, where do you see India in this? And, and you know, they are a complicated player on both these fronts. So, so what do you see going on? I mean, again, coming back to, if you look at, again, take the UN, um, the latest, about every two years, the UN comes out with projections, their projections for uh, world population by, by country, by region, by, by world. The, the most recent projection was in October of, of 2014. And when you look at India, not, not South, A South Asia, but if you just, just look at India proper, right now India has uh, about 1 billion people. By 2100, the projection is India will have 2 billion people. Um, India currently has 400 million of its 1 billion population off the grid. Um, that is, in the whole world, is 1.2 billion people off the grid. India has 400 million of those. Sub-Saharan Africa has 600 million. So again, most of the world is in those two regions. And, and again, I'm just sort of repeating what I was saying. I mean, it's a, it's a very difficult thing to do. So I mean, you want to get countries, right now, India is the third largest producer or emitter of CO2. So again, they're a very important player in that, that climate game. They're also the second largest number of people that are off the grid. And so to me, I'll throw it out to the people. I mean, how do we actually solve those two problems, those two competing problems? It, it's a major, major issue. And so the people that worry about, let's say, the politics and the, the policy over here, it's like, like how do you do that? I mean, um. To, to your question about India and China and how those get compared, I think um, uh, to, so some experts are saying that the U.S.-China agreement was really about levelizing per capita emissions. And so if, if China caps its coal and does a bunch of renewables and we slowly or, or fairly rapidly come down in our emissions here in the United States, within the next couple decades, we'll get to about parity in terms of per capita emissions. India is much lower than that. And so while, uh, while it's, it's, they need to be a part of it, uh, the new international architecture is going to be about uh, every country doing what it can. We have to recognize that they're coming from a, very, a, a lower per capita uh, emissions base. And so there's, in terms of equity, there is a little bit more room for growth there. And so we shouldn't expect for them to start decreasing their emissions, even though they're, they're very low. And, that, and the same goes for Africa. It's, it's interesting on, on the story of, of, of the, uh, President Obama's visit to India because I think what, once again, it, it, I think what it illustrates is sort of what I call the blank slate problem, that there was almost no coverage of the fact that the United States and India have, have developed over the last four or five years a very ambitious program of cooperation on clean energy uh, between our governments and what happened when President Obama went to India was actually an increase, a reaffirmation and an increase. So the United States and India are actually working today on clean energy at, at a level much higher than ever before. And then secondly, that there's, uh, we saw some real progress and continued progress on the whole issue of HFCs, which are a potent greenhouse gas. And also we've seen the continuation of a real dialogue. So while there wasn't a big breakthrough in terms of a Indian commitment to, towards a long-term goal or you know a, a creation of a major new pot of money the reality is is that we're seeing real progress but unfortunately it was a story that really didn't didn't surface okay always you know just blame the reporters it's always an easy thing to do <laughs> all right next question when we talk about leapfrogging of technologies typically on uh, on average the poor share a large burden of adopting it for example solar lanterns solar panels etc well they do have a greater willingness to pay in absolute uh, terms they pay uh, a lot more than the rich how does sustainable energy for all plan to address this and is it also taking the rich into account 
Yeah, that's a, a very good and complicated question. I mean, it is very unfair that we, you know, we we move into a new home and we, we you know, we get, get new utilities and get a bill in the mail and we're not asked to pay for the, the lines or anything else. It's just, you know, embedded in the overall cost, whereas we're asking the poorest people in the world to, to basically create all their own energy and, and, uh, and, and produce it. And so... Uh, it, that yeah, that is a big challenge, and the the upfront capital costs are, are are significant. You you do so on solar lanterns, for example. We are seeing some innovative financing models where, for example, if you can provide some of the upfront costs and basically, so the, 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 a solar lantern is offsetting the use of a kerosene lantern in a lot of instances. Well, if people, I think the average is in Africa, people pay four dollars a month for kerosene. If you can you know, help someone pay for a $15 solar lantern and help them set aside those $4 that they would have paid for kerosene within, five, you know, four or five months, they've paid for their system and then they own it. And so uh, there are ways of getting around that. It would be great if there was a lot more financing to uh, enhance those those smaller scale initiatives into much bigger ones so that that, that can be ramped much more quick, ramped up much more quickly. Um, sorry. So we have two kind of paired questions, um, and I also wanted, well, again, we've talked about India. Maybe I certainly think this might work um, uh, better to apply to Africa. Again, um, I was very interested around the time that there was the U.S.-Africa Leaders Summit. There was, of course, a lot of optimism about a new relationship and really, you know, kind of a kickstarting of the private the U.S. private sector in terms of its investment. Um, we have a couple of questions that I think might touch on this. One is, what are the biggest barriers in incentivizing the private sector to invest in developing countries? What activity are we seeing from the private sector in this, this area? And then kind of a related question, how significant are the governance issues in many of these countries to achieving those goals? So maybe Jacob could, do you want to start with that? I, I think that's... That's, the, the governance issues are absolutely critical, uh, and I think that the, you know, the whole question of you know creating uh, uh, market uh, policies that uh, incentivize investment uh, in in the energy transition is absolutely totally fundamental. Uh, there are major efforts underway uh, uh, by the United States and and other uh, developed countries to really work with developing countries to really deal with, with this dimension of the problem. And I think it, we often kind of gloss over it. It's more than just technology. It's more than just markets and financing. It, you really need good governance, stable governance, uh, which provides the right incentives and frameworks so that people can make investments uh, in, in renewables and alternatives and, 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 uh, and, 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 and move forward. And could we get a couple specific examples? Like, here's where there's been decent governance and it's made a difference in X country. Here's where it's been terrible and it's impeded in private investment. That would be, I think, helpful uh, if you're willing to talk. Yeah, so I think the Millennium Challenge Corporation offers an interesting model here. And Sustainable Energy for All has tried to mimic some of the aspects of the Millennium Challenge Corporation. Basically, it's a U.S. government entity that has, that creates compacts between the United States and specific uh, developing countries saying if you... Uh, change, you know, if you change uh, a number of regulations, policies, institutions, and improve them, we will commit to investing in your energy system, in your health system, et cetera, et cetera. And so I think, I mean, uh, numbers, uh, uh, growth numbers out of Africa are really high now, somewhere around 6% per year. Um, and that's due to countries like Ghana that have had things like compacts with the, U with, with the U.S. government through the Millennium Challenge Corporation to overhaul uh, their energy systems and, and enhance uh, uh, generation and transmission. And so you do start to see in places like Africa two tiered, two, you know, two, two lanes, two speeds, where you've got countries that do. 
have a lot of things together, have some stable institutions, have uh, rule of law, et cetera, where investments are s- starting to soar. The, the other initiative to mention is Power Africa and some of the goals that the U.S. government has put forward there. The Europeans have an equivalent uh, initiative where they're trying to get uh, 500, million, 500 million people out of energy poverty uh, by, tw- by 2030. Um, and so the, the difficulty is w- in the failed states, in the states that are not stable or have uh, practically no institutions whatsoever. Uh, it's very difficult to create that kind of, uh, that kind of momentum in places like that. Okay, um, so now I do, and I do probably want to get back to Power Africa, but I'm going to go on it because we uh, clearly have a lot of educators and academics in the audience. We have two educated and education-related questions I wanted to ask. Uh, what careers and certificate program uh, programs does higher education need to provide to support the Sustainable Energy for All initiative? And you've mentioned government industry par- uh, partnerships. What role can those of us in the education sector play to work towards the sustainable energy for all goals? I thought, Glenn, you might be able, as, as an academic, to take that first. Well, 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 certainly, I mean, one of the roles for education, I mean, certainly, let's say in the United States, the role for education, just as far as um, students that are coming through, and, and, and I do this myself with some of the courses that I teach on, on, on climate change and, and uh, um, kind of peak energy and, and resource scarcity type classes. Um, one of the important things is I think a lot of students and a lot of people even in the United States don't really realize the scope of the problem, how, how large this problem is, how difficult it's going to be to kind of solve these problems. And, and what I actually find as an academic when you're teaching students is, is they, they come in, they're not really aware of the scope of this problem. And when you kind of lay it out and, and show them, they say, well, you know, it's kind of a depressing thing about how are we going to actually get through this? But at the same time, when they come out, what, what they're always saying is the key for them is, is educating. So then they can go out and then educate other people, and it, it just propagates out that way. So from that point of view of just education, of just physically educating people, not necessarily providing, um, say, certain certificates of, like, Here's how you actually go build a better solar panel or something like that. But it's just the basic education that most people in the United States, I believe, don't really understand the scope of these problems that the world is facing. Other thoughts? Yeah. So um, on certificates and degrees, I was actually just having a conversation about this uh, yesterday with a colleague who works on energy efficiency issues, and we often forget that sustainable energy for all has gotten a lot of attention on the energy access side, but a lot a lot less on uh, the energy efficiency uh, aspect. And the rationale for doing efficiency as part of sustainable energy for all is that potentially half of the reduction in emissions – uh, that we need to stay under two degrees could come from energy efficiency over the next few decades, um, and so it's absolutely critical. And everyone says, you know, it's the f- f- it's the forgotten fuel, and even though it's the low hanging fruit, and actually, it's interesting to look around. And I'm, I may be wrong, and someone will probably say that I'm wrong, but. Uh, I don't know that there's a master's degree in you know energy efficiency policy, or uh, I've I've been trying to ask grad students recently how many uh, energy efficiency courses they're taking, and you know they say oh well, there's no real course it gets mentioned in this or this place, and so if we really believe that energy efficiency is so critical to climate change mitigation, uh, we should probably have it more embedded in our educational system through certificates, through formal master's degrees, where uh, you can come out of there and go work for a state government or or go work for a company and enhance uh, what we know we need to do in the, in, the, in the energy efficiency space. And then just on the students, I would, I would totally agree with Glenn. I think, I think there's a sense right now that young people both are horrified by the, the scale of what's coming to us through climate and uh, absolutely energized by the idea that we could tackle this, this, this huge issue uh, through all kinds of innovative and really exciting uh, technologies, new policies, and organizing. And I think, I think uh, we saw that in New York when 400,000 people were in the street uh, uh, wanting action on climate change. We're seeing it with organizations like 350.org that are, are bringing in a lot of students to work really hard on these issues. And so I I think uh, it's, awareness leads to a desire for action, and I think there's a lot of that, and it's growing right now. Got it. Jacob. Just to add where I could see uh, some real great value from greater academic engagement with the work we've been doing on this new architecture. We've been working with the Levotnik School of Government at Oxford University and with the Stanley Foundation 
on something that we call galvanizing the groundswell of climate actions, of which the sustainable energy for all is an example. And how do you organize and structure literally thousands of individual commitments to do something about this problem? What does this architecture look like? How do you encourage and support these commitments? How do you aggregate them? How do you measure them against global goals? This is a huge big data problem. Uh, we need to understand what's going on in the world a lot better than we do today, and we really would welcome uh, the engagement of academics and scholars in, in, in this endeavor. Great. Okay. Now, and this is something which I think Glenn might uh, start off on, but I'd be interested in what you all think. While green distributed uh, uh, for off-grid villages is a good start, what do you do for the mega cities of the world? Um, as more and more villagers move into cities, you will need grid scale power to meet their human development needs. And obviously, again, we're we're seeing tremendous growth in these mega cities, and it would be interesting to know kind of how that gets integrated into these development goals. Right. Um, certainly, one one of the things, is, is, and again, some of the stuff that we're looking at is, is is kind of this bringing people out of poverty. There's it's one thing to to give an individual or a family a um, a solar lantern or to give them a new way of uh, a cook stove. That, that, that's one thing. Um, the other thing, though, is, is, again, when you look at the research that people do, if you look around the world and the different countries, their, their energy per capita consumption around the world, what you actually find is that above about 100 gigajoules per person is, is actually that, that, that brings enormous benefits to society uh, as an individual country or a village or, or whatever. And so you really need to get that energy up to that 100 gigajoules per person. And beyond that, most of the gain comes in that. So, so again, these countries, Sub-Saharan Africa, um, South Asia, we're talking about numbers like 20 gigajoules per person per capita. You need to get that up to about 100. When you do that, when you get it up to about 100, in addition to just providing something like the, 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 the solar lantern or, the, or these better cook stoves, what you also get with that 100 gigajoules is you find out that you get um, increased female literacy. That leads to decreased fertility. Um, you also find that you, you know, the health care of the, of the population goes up. So you get enormous benefits from, from getting up to that level of about 100 gigajoules. And, and, and what that can lead to is, especially with that, that f increase in female literacy, is you can actually start to hopefully bend that population curve downward um, and you're not going to achieve that 10.9 billion. I mean, you want to achieve lower gra um, growth in population, but kind of on a, on a positive way rather than the negative Malthusian way of, of, of kind of decreasing population. You want to do it as a positive way. And I think by getting providing that energy, you can do that. How you provide that energy, obviously that, that 100 gigajoule, just those numbers, um, it's, it's much easier to do it where you have grids than, than individuals. Ryan, do you want to turn in on that? Yeah. Um, so as part of sustainable energy for all, the conversation has been about an energy ladder. Um, it's undeniable that having lighting to be able to study at night or, you know, be able to work work longer hours, et cetera, is a, is a huge benefit, but you don't want to stop there. And so, and often people have a, a greater desire for a, a TV or a radio or be able to charge their cell phone than just for lighting. And so you, you there's a pathway for getting from one to the next and you don't just absolutely, you don't just just stop with lighting. I think the other key is that it's not just personal energy consumption, it's energy systems throughout society. So for example, one of the initiatives we're working on under Sustainable Energy for All is electrifying rural health clinics. There's, a, there's good evidence that you can really enhance um, health outcomes if you have electricity in, in, in rural health clinics, including in, in, in ways you wouldn't think of. For example, you have better staff retention in rural areas if those people can charge their cell phones and things like like that, in addition to all the things you would expect in terms of, you know, being able to have a sonogram or, you know, be able to make it do a delivery at night if it's if it's needed. Go ahead. Uh, okay, so uh, here's an interesting question. In terms of sustainable energy for all, how do we include people of color, um, and there's a word I can't understand, um, in these debates and conversations? So, you know, I am interested in that. Again, maybe one thing would be who are some of the leaders that we're seeing in developing countries? Again, whether it's entrepreneurs, whether it's heads of state and so forth who are helping drive those conversations. What are the ways you kind of just talked about a very granular example of unpacking the impact of electrification? Are there examples of, of, of how people on the ground are being involved in these conversations that are ultimately helping drive the policy solutions? Yeah, absolutely. Sorry. It, absolutely. I mean, it's a little unfortunate that we have three white, white, white males on this panel this morning because the, the, the Sustainable Energy for All initiative is, is, is much more 
uh, diverse. The the so Condi Umkella, who leads the Sustainable Energy for All initiative, is one of these kind of rising stars within the the the, the international system. Um, he was the head of the UN Industrial Develop, Development Organization for for years and had this deep seated passion for uh, for these issues and. Uh, he talks about how he grew up without electricity and with a dirty cook stove and and that this isn't just some policy issue for him it's about helping you know his cousins back home in Sierra Leone and interestingly enough the secretary general of the united nations as well talks about his studies uh you know growing up in south korea and ha- being during exam time he would they, their family would splurge and buy a candle so that he could study as hard as possible and do a good job on his exams. So it's not that far in our past that people who are extremely successful today, uh, you know, a, a gen- who are working on this on the ground are all the people you would expect who need these services, um, not people like us. <laughs> all right. A um, couple other questions, and we're almost out of time. Um, and this, I think, is a Jacob question. What do you want to see in the communique coming out of COP21 to address energy access? Is there specific guidance you might want to give on that? Well, I think that's going to be the question of what's going to come out of COP21 is the subject of the next, next session. Uh, you know, I think that uh, all I'd say there is that I hope that uh, when we look towards Paris that we see that it's got to be more than just uh, an agreement about a set of goals 10 to 15 years in the future. It's got to be more than just uh, the creation of more funds. It really has to be about what the French are calling the agenda of solutions, of using this again as another platform to uh, uh, encourage all elements of society to make new uh, commitments uh, and just as important to expand and enlarge their commitments so that we come out of Paris with a sense that in, that in fact uh, there's a real revolution going on, that we really are going to start moving very, very quickly. And so, you know, I think I see sustainable energy for all as sort of a, a key model for the kind of, of structures that we need to, to bring this about, and I hope that we'll see a great attention in power is to not only sustainable energy for all, but the the new efforts by in in the transportation arena, among cities, on forests that involve all these partners and and real concrete actions. Oh, go ahead. Do you want to say so, uh, so actually, the Sustainable Energy for All initiative has been having some discussions with the French, and it's going to be one of the initiatives that's prominently highlighted at COP21. There's uh, just being in Lima a few weeks ago, there's clearly a sense that uh, thinking about the energy access issue and the potential for mitigation and adaptation solutions to also integrate energy access is a way to bring developing countries on board in the climate negotiations. And yet there's a risk, I think, in the climate negotiations to want to pile on every single issue out there and deal with things that aren't strictly related to solving the climate problem. Um, And so maybe there's not anything on energy access in the climate negotiations because that's not the proper place for it, and it's more spurred on by initiatives like Sustainable Energy for All. But in the background, if that conversation is going on, developing countries could be much more willing to come to the table on climate if they know that they're going to get help on energy access in different fora. And then very briefly, we have something like one minute left. Uh, You know, you guys seem fairly optimistic given the daunting challenges that we face globally, whether you're talking about, uh, you know, the political uh, instability and strife, the fact that Europe, which obviously is a key player, is in the midst of a really challenging economic time, that Ebola has, you know, eroded some of the gains people immediately had thought would happen. Uh, Could a couple of you just share your parting thoughts of, of why you are optimistic that this is achievable? Just so people feel better about that. Yeah, um, yeah I, guess you, I guess you want to close on a, on a, on a, on a positive note. Um, l- l- let me just give just, just two like, like quick statistics for just to put people in their mind right now. Um, we've been talking for about one hour. Um, in that one hour, the world has actually extracted 900,000 tons of coal. One hour. 
No, no, this is this the negative. It, it, within, within one hour, the world has extracted 3.6 million barrels of oil. In this one hour, the world population has increased by 9,400 people. So there are now 9,400 more people in the world than there were when we started this discussion. So, so, but, but the optimistic part is, so the optimistic part is, is no, the, the, these, are, these are the daunting challenges. And so, so one, one of the things is, is I, I was trying to think about it, something. So, so there's actually a quote uh, from a 1962 quote. It says, we, cho we choose to go to the moon in this decade and to do those things not because they are easy, but because they are hard because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our um, energies and skills, because that challenge is one that we are willing to accept, one that we are unwilling to postpone, and one which we can intend to win. That was John F. Kennedy with the mission to the moon, and they actually accomplished it. In 1962, nobody thought that that could happen. 1969, it happened. So what I'd like to say, the, the positive thing is, if you can't provide that energy for all, you get those benefits that I mentioned as far as um, increased literacy, uh, in decreased uh, fertility. So what I'd like to leave um, with is, is, is kind of a paraphrase of, of, of Kennedy, um, is just say that we choose to provide energy for all in, the dec in, the, in this coming century um, because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills because that challenge is one that we are willing to accept, one that we are unwilling to postpone, and one which we can intend to win. Very well said. Hard to follow. I, I think I, I would say, how can we not be optimistic in a year when both the development and the climate issues are going to be dealt with in a serious way? There are huge, daunting challenges, but there are opportunities to bring all of those conversations together. Um, and uh, you know, how could we not hope for the best and try uh, try everything we can to get where we need to where we need to get on these issues? And I think what, what gives me hope is, I think, the, the connectivity. I think if we didn't have uh, the internet, uh, I would feel very uh, uh, concerned about our ability to deal with these challenges. But I think with connectivity, we have the ability to communicate ideas and to cooperate with people around the world in a way that simply wasn't even possible even 10 years ago. And I think the pace of change for both good and bad is accelerating. So it gives me some hope that these ideas will get out there and they will move very, very quickly. And when we go to Paris in December, it's not just going to be the 4,000 negotiators or the 50 or 100,000 people there. I think what we for better or worse, is that climate change is no longer abstraction for people. And we're seeing people concerned and engaged and motivated around the world. And ultimately, it will be the pressure from below that will force our leaders to really take the steps to make the necessary transition to to sustain to sustain our societies. Great. Please join me in thanking our three panelists for exploring these issues. Thank you very much. If the next and final panel can come to the stage, we'd be very appreciated.